that it's going to send a message that sexual violence and the treatment of women in the criminal justice system has to be addressed. When was the last time you, you saw your family? I think it's less about race and less about um, racism. To a lot of black families, it does feel like it's about race. President Trump may have rescinded his invite to the Philadelphia Eagles, but he didn't skip the chance to throw a patriotic pep rally and criticize kneeling NFL players. We love our country, we respect our flag, and we always proudly stand for the national anthem. We always will stand for the national anthem. A Romanian man has won the right for his American husband to be granted residence in Romania so the two can live together there. Romania is one of six EU countries that don't recognize same-sex marriage. The EU's highest court says that for residency benefits, at least, they have to. At a Senate hearing, Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos faced questions about the Federal Commission on School Safety, which she chairs. Will your commission look at the role of firearms as it relates to gun violence in our schools? That is not part of the commission's charge, per se. That's surprising, because one of the commission's specific tasks is to provide recommendations on age restrictions for buying guns. Do you believe an 18-year-old high school student should be able to walk into a store and minutes later come out with an AR-15 style assault weapon and hundreds of rounds of ammunition? I believe that's very much a matter for debate. We are no longer a pageant. We are a competition. We will no longer judge our candidates on their outward physical appearance. Miss America 2.0 is getting rid of its swimsuit competition, overhauling the evening gown component, and shifting its judgmental gaze inward. Who doesn't want to be empowered and be able to show the world who you are as a person from the inside of your soul? It's primary day in California, and liberal rage at Trump's Washington is making it a busy one. California has 53 different House races, many with wide open primaries that could help decide control of Congress. And in the governor's race alone, there are 27 candidates to choose from. All of that chaos is obscuring one local race that otherwise would be getting national attention, the campaign to recall and replace Judge Aaron Persky. He's the man who presided over the case of Brock Turner the Stanford swimmer who sexually assaulted an unconscious woman. Persky sentenced him only to six months in jail, plus probation. Now it's the judge who's facing judgment. Yeah. So we'll just fix it. I think Almaden's the busier street, don't you? That's where I put them both down there. Yeah. Michelle Dauber is the head of the recall campaign. She's a law professor at Stanford and a personal friend of the woman Brock Turner attacked. So, this part of the campaign which is, which looks, like, looks like a more like a regular traditional campaign right now. You're walking around, you're knocking on doors. How long has that part been going on? Oh, we've been doing this basically the whole time. We had to collect over 58,000 signatures and we ended up collecting over 95,000, which we did mostly by knocking on doors. And I want to give a big shout out to the crowd with Michelle Dauber for helping to recall Judge Persky. Thank you very much, Michelle, and everyone you brought out to help out today. Team Recall! Woo! Dauber is in charge of a very serious campaign operation she launched two years ago. More than a million dollars raised and spent. Dozens of volunteers. Judges in California are elected and they are accountable to the people they serve. The only thing that is a little different about a recall is that um, Judge Persky was up for re-election in 2022 and by using the petition we moved the date up to 2018. Essentially, Dauber's been the keeper of the outrage, sparked all across the country after the Turner sentence. Earlier this morning, Brock Turner was released from jail after only three months. <laughs> Although a lot of lawyers across the country have backed her, in Santa Clara County, she's facing down the bulk of the legal establishment. They don't agree with the recall effort, and that includes the district attorney whose office prosecuted Turner in the first place. Is Judge Persky a good judge? Uh, he's, uh, he's a good judge, and, uh, you know, he, he's reflective of the judges that we have. But he made a mistake county. in this case, but Absolutely. he's a good judge. Absolutely. While on the one hand, 
I was angry and sad, I wasn't surprised. And the reason I wasn't surprised is I've been a prosecutor here for more than 20 years. What this judge did in the case is something that most of the judges on our bench would have done and what most judges in California would have done before the law was changed. Here's what Rosen means. At the time of the Turner case, there were state laws and sentencing rules that pushed judges to give first-time offenders like Turner lenient sentences. So Rosen championed a new state law. It forces all judges to give defendants convicted of the same crimes Turner was at least three years in state prison, also known as a mandatory minimum sentence. Judicial independence is something that's central to our society. Whatever the issue is you have in front of the judge, you want that judge to look at you and treat you as an individual and not think about the ballot box or the judge's career or what's going to happen. And my concern about the recall is that judges will think to themselves, well, how's this going to play in public opinion? The weekend before the election, both sides were campaigning. We reached out to Persky, but he didn't get back to us. Dauber's volunteers were blasting texts to thousands of people who already promised to vote for the recall. Their concern is low turnout. I think that the legal profession has definitely uh, linked arms with Judge Persky against the recall, but ordinary voters strongly support this recall and feel as they did in uh, 2016. The statement that was essentially made by the passage of that mandatory minimum was, um, Judge Persky has screwed up so badly and so abused his discretion that we need to pass a law to make sure that no other judge can ever do this again. To me, that's an independent reason to recall him. The reality here is that it's hard to find anyone who thinks the Brock Turner sentence was the right punishment. What you have now are people using the political system to call bullshit on the judicial one. Your opponents think you're gonna win. And what, they're, know. And what they're worried about is that this is gonna set a precedent that judges are just going to throw the book at everybody so they don't get recalled. Yeah. What do you think it's gonna do? I think that it's going to send a message that sexual violence and the treatment of women in the criminal justice system has to be addressed. New York is a cosmopolitan city, but its public schools are incredibly segregated. Mayor Bill de Blasio just announced a plan to do something about this by making New York's elite high schools more diverse. One of the city's school districts is already debating its own plan to desegregate. And if that experiment is any indication, the mayor might be about to face a lot of angry parents. One of the city's wealthiest, wokest districts is constructing a plan to do something about its segregation. But as the chancellor of New York City Public Schools noted on Twitter, it's not going over well with everyone. You're telling them you're going to go to a school that's not going to educate you in the same way you've been educated. Life sucks. Is that what the DOE wants to say? That clip from a public meeting about the plan turned a local news story into a national conversation. New York City's District 3 includes both the white and wealthier parts of the Upper West Side and black, brown, and poorer sections of Southern Harlem. There are 16 middle schools in the district, and thanks to a complicated set of admissions criteria, the top performing schools are dominated by affluent white and Asian kids. Fewer than 10% of the students at those schools come from low-income families. In some other parts of the district, almost 100% of the kids come from low-income families of color. So parents and District 3 leaders introduced a plan that would reserve at least 25% of all seats at each school for students who are struggling. This means some high-achieving students aren't going to get their top school choice. We have not addressed part of our district, and that, to me, is our problem. The conversations that we're having right now are really, really important, and they're really, really emotional and um, we're not going to solve them tonight. We're not. Kim Watkins is the chair of District 3's Community Education Council. Support. It's fear. Um, I think it's less about race and less about um, racism. To a lot of black families, it does feel like it's about race. And the arguments sound a lot like what some of them heard in the 1950s. I'm not racist, but I don't want my kids around kids who don't perform well. I'm a white parent. 
in Harlem. And, you know, I, I'm, I would never think twice about having my kids sit next to a black kid in a class. The District 3 fight exposes the conflict between families' desire to choose the best public school for their kids and the community's real need for equitable education. And then just how hard it is to get individual families to stop thinking about school choice like it's a zero-sum game. Do you think that the parents of high-performing students end up feeling like they actually deserve the best of what the public schools offer, even if it's at the expense of kids who are struggling? I unequivocally would say there is no owed spots in, uh, in the public school system. To the extent that it seems that parents feel that way is a flaw in public education, and I think it's an unsustainable environment if we want public education to succeed. The warlord Joseph Kony is believed to be hiding out in the borderlands of the Central African Republic, where more than 15 armed groups are fighting to control the country's resources. As head of the Lord's Resistance Army, Kony has been indicted by the International Criminal Court for, among other crimes, abducting and recruiting children. I did not abduct anybody, and there's no any children in my position or in my camp. According to the United Nations, over the last five years, at least 13,000 children in the Central African Republic have been kidnapped and turned into soldiers. One of the most powerful rebel groups here is the Popular Front for the Renaissance of the Central African Republic, or the FPRC. It's made up of people from the country's Muslim minority who fought the Lord's Resistance Army many times. They claim that they don't use child soldiers. But while we were there, we met two boys who'd been captured after separate battles with rival groups. Instead of being released, they've been made to fight. We spoke with Mohamed Saeed, a founding member of the FPRC and one of its most senior generals in Bria. Can you describe what happened when you fought with the LRA and captured the, the young fighter? Les gens de la LRA sont venus appréhender, veut dire attraper les personnes dans leur village. C'est à cause de ça qu'ils sont en train de circuler et chercher à monopoliser cette zone. Ils arrachent le mort, les vivres, les enfants, et le bagage, c'est fini, ils partent. C'est à cause de ça qu'on avait pris nos hommes pour pouvoir les poursuivre. Et puis, ils se sont combattus. Et ils ont récupéré et les enfants. Didier used to be with the LRA, and Abakar was taken from the anti-Balaka forces. Can you describe some of the things you had to do? And the new kidnapped people, that was that was other other children who had been kidnapped who were being trained to fight as well. Abakar was captured seven months ago. He says he was 17 at the time. What did they do to everybody else? <laughs> And now you're fighting for the FPRC. Um, how do you think this is going to end? So long being gone. And do you want to stay here and keep fighting, or, or do you want to go home? I'm going to continue to go to Rubu. I'm going to change the government. Did they ever say what would happen to you if you refused to fight or refused to do any of the work they wanted you to do? 
that happen? Were there kids who 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 were there the Americans sent troops here looking for him. The Ugandans sent troops here looking for him. They spent million, many millions of dollars. They had lots of equipment. Why do you think they were unable to catch him? When you were fighting for the LRA, you had no choice because if you didn't, you would be killed. What do you think you're fighting for now, here? But when was the last time you, you saw your family? Why can't you hand the young fighter over? He, he says he's 17 years old now, but he was captain when he was 10. Um, can he not be returned to his family in Congo? No, on va le remettre. On va le remettre. Actuellement, il a 18 ans. Mais nous, il ne nous intéresse même pas. Ce qui est là, on a envoyé actuellement à ses parents au niveau de, du Zahir, euh, du Congo démocratique. On a déjà écrit et envoyé. Si Ses parents sont venus, on va les remettre officiellement à leur part. Four months after we filmed this interview, Didier and Abakar remain hostages of the FPRC, with no news about when or if they will be allowed to return to their families. What inspires you? People, and I think the environment. I look at the street and, you know, I'm not sure I reflect the street as much as I absorb it and then interpret it. The waters off Alaska are one of the best spots in the world for commercial fishing. But the average boat trawling its icy waters is getting pretty old. A brand new supership was supposed to change that and revolutionize the future of American fishing. Instead, it's making enemies in Alaska and on Capitol Hill. Yeah. There's no ship like this in this country or in the world for that matter. You don't name your fishing boat America's Finest if you lack confidence. But it's possible Helena Park was a little too confident. Her company's $75 million ship might never fish in American waters because of an almost century-old law referred to as the Jones Act. When this first thing came up, I had a question, how do we miss it? But then that's why we did an investigation. And it's just accidental, honest mistake. The Jones Act is intended to protect manufacturing jobs by requiring all ships transporting goods between U.S. ports to be made in America. And though 700,000 hours of American labor went into building America's finest, just under 10% of its steel was made and bent in Europe, far more than the allowable limit. I built this vessel to prove the American capabilities. Mm -hmm. But in the end, it was the detail of the Jones Act that got us in this predicament. You might think nobody would build a $75 million ship without studying the rule book. And it's still unclear how the shipyard made such a huge mistake. Initially, the ship's owners weren't too concerned. They thought the government would quickly pass a waiver like they've done several times before. Instead, legislators decided to make an example of America's finest, and the waiver might never pass the Senate. Some people say it's because the fishing industry is too cutthroat to give anyone a break. Uh, we have a big $40 million project that we're coming up on 
right now. Frank Kelty is the mayor of a tiny fishing village called Unalaska. Population, 4,437. He wrote to Alaska's congressional delegation in January, urging them to oppose the waiver request to protect jobs in the town's fish factories. We're at uh, Universal Seafoods. It's the largest processing plant for pollock in, in the Yanalaska Dutch Harbor area. Is onshore processing of seafood, is it important for Unalaska, economically speaking? Very, very important to Unalaska. It is our main revenue driver for our community. It's the economic engine of the city. Small vessels unload fish in coastal towns like Unalaska. But large, modern ships like America's Finest often have their own factories on board. America's Finest can process more than 500,000 pounds of fish a day. That's a threat to Alaska's coastal processing industry. And the communities it supports are concerned that modernizing the fleet would mean a big shift towards more factory ships. So, Unalaska seized on the Jones Act as a last-ditch attempt to stop America's Finest. The waiver having to do with the steel, it, why link those two things together? Well, I don't have any opinion on the, on the steel issue. My constituents are on Alaska, and the right. plants here are my constituency, and that's what I want to look out for. Last week, the House passed a waiver for America's Finest, but the Senate hasn't budged. Park is now considering selling America's Finest to a foreign firm if it doesn't. An Alaska and its allies could be slowing modernization for now, but this won't be the last threat they face. This whole episode sent a big message to the industry that in addition to the regular risk investing in new technology, now you have to add to the risk of, uh, of facing the Jones Act lobby and the competitors who want to use their political power to crush your company. Ah, damn it, this is great. Welcome to Dad Opinions, starring John Darnielle, the dude from the Mountain Coats. I said slavery a choice, they said hi, yay. Just imagine if they caught me on a wild day. Now I'm on 50 blogs, getting 50 calls. My wife calling, screaming, say we about to lose it all. It's the new Kanye, is that, yeah. Here's the thing about Kanye. We presently are in a time where people cover people's personalities a lot, or opinions or whatever, and that's fine, I guess. But I don't care. I only care about somebody's music. Guys like me, who were around for the, the first two waves of rap, are pretty weak for a good Kanye hook. Been sleeping with no clothes on. You never came home. Two nights in a row, where'd you go? I've been smoking. I can't find much to hold on there, except that, you know, the singer sleeps in the nude and so do I, so we have something in common there. This is a weird melange of influences. There was the very Rick Rubin sounding trimmed electric guitar, no, nah, no, nah, no, nah. but then a proper Houdini sort of uh, vibe to the high 808 sound. Nothing seems to have any function beyond color palette. I don't hear any players and I don't hear a singer, I hear an effects chain. I can't hold any interest in that. It's not for me. What is this? This is really interesting music to me. A pretty dark vibe to the hook there. I'm generally more interested in stuff that sort of asks a little more of you, whether it's the intensity of Joni Mitchell's presentation, a voice that tends to cut through stuff, or whether it's death metal. So this felt to me in that kind of ballpark. Unless you become the kind of person who says that music was better when you were in high school. You should avoid that, but statistically speaking, you won't. You will someday say how good things were when you were young. Not me, though. <laughs> <God>. <laughs>